from Quentin. We'll go live and get going here. All right, so just want to welcome everybody in person, online, and just uh, we had awesome worship. Wow, it felt like you went to the throne room of God and were worshiping around the very theme of the hour of Revelation chapter 5. The Lamb who sits on the throne, that He is coming and He's going to take that book and break open that book seal by seal and shake everything that can be shaken. So, amen, amen. And so, I, we're going to continue today and this is still part, this is still session four. Hindrances to abiding in our class, indwelling life. This is part two, continuation from last Sunday. There was just too much to get in to do it all in one session. So anyway, I want you to go ahead and let's, let's turn in the, in the scriptures now. And we're going we're gonna to turn and we're going to read a couple scriptures before we dive in here and just really want to get the Lord's heart in this. This is one of those messages where I feel like when, when I was writing my book, Indwelling Life, um, that now is now available. Uh, a little plug here. You can get this in dwellinglife.com. Wow, Mary's already got her book, Star Student. So this is a proof copy, but you can get the, this now live in dwellinglife.com. When I was writing this chapter four, this is one of those chapters where I, ha I think I rewrote it about 15 times. It's just very, it, it takes a lot of precision. And I, I want to make sure I speak this accurately today because. It's one of those things, it's almost like doing surgery. You want to make sure that, that it's really stated in balance because it could swing you to the one way or the other. So I'm, I'm praying that God would give me the grace of God to, to speak this in balance. But we want to start here in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 14. And Paul is writing, and I would encourage you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It's a really powerful script, uh, passage of Scripture. But Paul is writing, and in verse 14, he says, But a natural man, and that word natural actually means soulish, a soulish man, one who is governed by the soul, one whose mind, will, and emotions are governing, leading, and influencing, that natural, that soulish man, you can be a soulish person whether you're born of the Spirit or whether you're not, in fact, if you're not born of the Spirit, you're by default a soulish person. You're governed by the soul. You're governed by self-life in the soul. But if, you're, if you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, then, and you have Christ living inside of you, then you have a choice which life source to live from. Whether you live from Christ's life in your spirit, or whether you live from self-life in your soul. And Paul is saying here, but a natural man, a soulish man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. So in God's dealings, in God's surgical work, and I, I believe we're entering in, this is kind of a, a message where God wants to do uh, some surgery on us, that God's goal in doing surgery on us is to separate so that we can see before us what part of our being is influencing us. In other words, that we would see, okay, am I being influenced by the soul? Am I being influenced by the body? Am I being influenced by the Spirit of God? What part of me is governing me? What part is leading me? What part is the leader of my life? Is it my soul, my self-life in my soul, my body, my, the cravings of the body? Or is it the Spirit of God who is now one spirit with your spirit? And so let's now read uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Or actually, let's read John chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. And this is what we started this class off with. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. The Father as the vine dresser has uh, pruning a pruning instrument in his hand. And if you've been walking with the Lord long enough, you know he prunes you. And when he prunes you, he cuts back to the very nub. <laughs> How many of you have experienced that, that cutting back of the Lord where he prunes you back to the very nub? Now, he's not doing it because he's mean. He do, he's doing it because he wants you to bear fruit. 
Verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, this is sobering right here, he takes away. And if you read down in the little bit long, in the passage, you realize that if you don't abide in the Lord, even if you're a Christian, then, you, then, he, then he takes you away and puts you into the fire. Now we'll save that, what all that means for another lesson. But every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that you may bear more fruit. What God wants to do is he wants to prune us. He wants to cut back the self-life in the soul so that more of the spirit of God, that the life of God in our spirit can be released. But yet there are hindrances to this abiding life. There are hindrances to the spirit of God being fully released and God wants to cut back those hindrances. Well, how does he do it? The Lord answers us in the very next verse. Verse 3. You are already clean, or that word actually means pruned. It's the same word as the one in the previous verse. You are already pruned because of the word that I have spoken to you. How does God prune us? Sometimes it's trials, sometimes it's tribulation, but always, 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 it is the living and the active Word of God. It is the living and the active Word of God that comes in like a two-edged sword and cuts to the division of soul and spirit. It is the living and the active Word of God that does surgery deep within us so that we can see, oh, this part of me is influencing me. This is my self-life. This is my soul that's influencing and leading and causing me not to be led by the Spirit of God. So let's now turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 to set the context. Hebrews 4, verse 12. We read this last Sunday, but we're going to read it just one more time. It's a very important scripture verse that is revealing how God prunes us. How does God prune us? By his word. What does that look like? It looks like this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit. Now, the King James Version says it divides asunder soul and spirit. In other words, the idea here is that the living, the active Word of God penetrates down deep into that innermost part of our being and separates out and divides asunder out those, the, the spirit and the soul so we know when we realize, okay, this part of me that I thought was God leading me is actually just my emotions, this part of me that I thought was me hearing the voice of God is actually just my own thoughts. See, what I was feeling was just my emotions. It wasn't God. So God, God's living and active word separates and divides and just causes that dividing asunder to get down to this, this intertwining of the spirit and the soul is separated, is divided. Why does he do that? His goal is to reveal the life source that we are living from. And see, and until the Lord shows you, you're, until the Lord shows you, okay, you have a spirit-to-spirit -spirit union with the Holy Spirit. We talked about that. But until the Lord highlights to you self-life in the soul, you don't even realize, I don't even realize how much of me is still living. And when I'm still living, that selfishness suppresses the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, then fruit is limited, and God wants much fruit from you. And that fruit is the fruit of Jesus Christ. So God comes with his living and his active word to divide soul from spirit, to show you, to show me, what life source are you living from? Are you living from Christ here in your spirit? Or are you living from self-life in your soul? And most of us, like I said last Sunday, most of us have a mixture. Some it might be 20% spirit, 50% soul. Uh, what's that? 30% body. You know, there, there's a mixture of, you know, not every, there's probably not anyone alive that is 100% spirit. 
Not anyone alive that's 100% spirit. There's mixture in all of us, but God wants to remove the mixture so that we can be the spirit-led sons of God that God is wanting to raise up in this hour. Amen. And so God comes with the, the living and the active word of God like a two-edged so sword to cut and to divide, to separate, to show you what life source are you living from. And until we know our spirit is one spirit with the Holy Spirit, we talked about that in session two or session three, session three. And until we know what self-life in the soul really looks like, then by default, we're going to live by self-life in the soul. And so what I want to do in this session is, is, is walk through just some of these common hindrances that, that, that are uh, the expressions of soul life so we can understand how we, are, we can limit the release of the Spirit from within us so God might prune that back so more of Christ can be released, more of the fruit of the Spirit can come forth. Now, I want to show this slide here. If the body of this is uh, this is taken from Watchman Nee's book, The Spiritual Man, but I, I changed it just a little bit. I want you to see this. If the body of sin rules, then the soul will obey sin. If the soul rules, then the soul will obey self. And if the spirit rules, the soul will obey the Holy Spirit. See, God wants us, this, this separation of the soul and the spirit is so our soul will obey the Holy Spirit, not partially, not partially, not sometimes, but that our soul would obey the Holy Spirit all the time and that immediately. Delayed obedience is still disobedience. Partial obedience is still disobedience. God wants to raise up those who obey the Lord Jesus Christ, every commandment in this book, everything God speaks. He wants to have a people who are obedient to him, obedient to the inward promptings of the Holy Spirit all the time, 100%. Yet the soul, we know the soul can come in and justify and excuse why it's okay to do this or why it's okay to do this or why this is okay for you or why that's okay. And the Lord wants to move back and bring the, the work of the cross to the soul, to the self-life in the soul, not because he's mean, but because he wants a greater release of Jesus Christ coming out from within us. So I want to talk about four, we're going to talk about five hindrances Number one, we're going to talk about, the, we're going to, the first four are going to be expressions of soul life. Because a lot of times, okay, what does it look, what does soul life look like? What does self-life look like? And so as we go through this, this is very important that we, we, we make sure we uh, have balance and precision in what I'm saying here. So it's very easy to hear me say something and to become overly analytical, I mentioned that last, last Sunday, we can become so overly analytical, is this coming from my spirit, is this coming from my soul, that we can't even like, you know, brush our teeth or use the bathroom unless Gabriel comes in and blows a trumpet and says, son of man, you know, brush your teeth, don't use that kind, use this kind. You know, we can get so weird, so we gotta be very careful that we get over analytical in this, or we, you know, we wanna have balance in this. So just. This is something that you're going to have to work through and read through and, and really think through, okay, Lord, help me to understand this. I'm trying my best to make sure it's, this is balanced and it doesn't send you, send you into this place of over-analytical paralysis where you can't do anything that, you know, that we're truly understanding the, the way God wants us to be. But the first one here is natural strength. See, for the soulish Christian, the one who is governed by the soul, Self is at the center of everything they do, even if what they're doing is for God and in the name of God. I mean, I don't know what the percentage is, but much of Western Christianity today is soulish Christianity. It's the soul operating. It's self-life operating, but it's still... It's not led by the Spirit of God. Even though we can, they quote the scriptures and know the book, they don't know the person. <laughs> and so God wants to, to bring back this soul life so that we can have spirit-led, spirit-led believers. See, even, 
You know, a lot of times we think the soulless Christian is someone who's in filthy sin, but a lot of times a soulless Christian can be one who is serving God adamantly or serving God in an honorable way, serving God in a way that people go, wow, he really loves the Lord. She really loves the Lord. Look at her the way she prays. Look at the way, you know, the way she reads the scriptures and she fasts. But if you really peel back the layers of that onion, you realize, okay, that actually is not being led by the spirit. That's being led by the soul. That's being led by natural strength. See, God does not want us to be led by natural strength. He wants us to be led by the Spirit of God, strengthening your spirit. That power, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead, then overflows into your heart and soul. And that power, that grace is what energizes you, not your natural strength, not your soul. Because when your natural strength is energizing you, no matter what you do, it ultimately comes back down as you're doing it for yourself, even if you're doing it in the name of Jesus Christ. You see that? You see the, you know, you think about this. Okay, what does it look like when someone lives by natural strength? You may exert all of your energy trying to live for God instead of living from God. There's a huge difference. Trying to live for God. God says, I need to do this. God says, I need to be patient. God says, I need to walk in love. God says, I need to pray. And so we exert all of our energy trying to live for God instead of living from God by the power he supplies to do what he calls us to do. See, when you're living by natural strength, you will exert all of your energy trying to live for God instead of living from God. When you're, trying, when you're living by natural strength, you'll exert all of your energy trying to keep God's commandments and God's word. Now, that's better than disobeying by all means, but you will find out very quickly that if you try to obey every single thing Jesus expects from us, we are going to fail a, mi a million times because God, this, this Christian life he's called us to, this Sermon on the Mount he's called us to, the overcoming life he's called us to is impossible. You cannot do it. You cannot make yourself ready. That doesn't mean... That doesn't mean we're not called to make ourselves ready. That doesn't mean we're not called to obey. We've got a whole session on this. There's, there's nuance here I'll, I'll explain later. But my point is this, is that we exert all of our effort and energy to try to obey God, and we realize it is impossible. There is one person that can obey God, and that's Jesus Christ. And there's one person that can obey God in you, and that's Christ in you. Him living in through you is the only way you can keep God's word. It's the only way you can live the Sermon on the Mount lifestyle. It's the only way you can overcome. It's the only way you can be a spirit-led son of God. Christ in you kept the moral law perfectly while he lived on earth, and he keeps the moral law perfectly in you if you let him live. And don't allow your soul to try and do it. Like the Galatians and Paul told the Galatians, you foolish Galatians, you started out so great, but now you're trying to be perfected by the flesh. What are you thinking? Who's bewitched you? You started out so awesome. You started out so great. Now you're trying to carry, out, carry it out in your own soul power and your own self-determination, self-assertion, self-reliance, natural strength. And see, in Romans 7, Paul had a battle with the, with the law. When the word of God came and said, you shall not covet, it revealed to Paul, I'm going to try my best not to covet. I'm going to try my best not to covet. I'm going to try my best not to covet. And what did Paul do? He coveted every single time. And he realized, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin and death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ my Lord. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Only Christ in you can keep his commandments. That doesn't mean we lower the standard. We actually, the standard is like way higher than under the old covenant. But it's Christ in you that keeps it. See, when you're living from self-life in the soul, you will apply your natural strength your natural giftings, your natural resources, your natural creativity, your natural talents to try to accomplish something for God. 
Now, don't go to the other extreme and say, okay, I'm so worried about that that I'm not going to do anything. Okay, there's another, there's another pit you can fall into. But instead of, see, the, the soulless Christian will use their natural strength, their natural gifting, their natural creativity, their natural influence, their natural ability, their natural charisma to go out and do great things for God instead of waiting on the Lord in prayer for revelation, direction, insight, wisdom, strategy, and then only doing and only, uh, only allowing the, the life of God to then energize and empower the natural creativity or talents or resources God's given you. See, God doesn't get rid of those things. He uses them by the Spirit of God. See what I'm saying? So there's one way where you can go out and apply without, without just on your, in your own self-effort and your own self-strength to do something for God using your own natural abilities rather than relying on the Spirit to empower those natural abilities to be empowered by the Spirit of God. I mean, if we're being honest, all of us at one time or another have done a good work instead of a God work, haven't we? We've done a good work. We've been like Abraham. You know, Abraham said, okay, well, God is delaying his promise. I've got a great idea. I'm going to go and have, I'm going to go have relations with uh, Hagar and I'm going to give birth to Ishmael. Maybe God might do something through Ishmael. I mean, all of us at one time or another have said, okay, I think what God really wants me to do is help him out. I think what the Lord really wants me to do is to employ my good ideas and try to come up with a plan and a strategy and a marketing idea and gimmicks to maybe help God out because I think he really wants me to think for myself. And the Lord's like, no, that's not what I want. What I want is I want you to wait on me to hear my voice and to obey what I say to do. Don't come up with a good idea. Wait on him for the God idea. Because if we do the good idea, we're going to give birth to the flesh. And if we do the God idea, we'll give birth to the spirit. See, every time we live by natural strength, self is at the center. No matter how incredible the righteous acts may appear, we're giving, we're praying, we're fasting, we're worshiping. But Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, yeah, but you're doing it to be noticed and to be praised by men. Because self is at the center. You're not doing it for an audience of one. You know, Jude mentioned, Jude 1, verse 11, he talked about the, the, what had happened in the church, and he said, they've gone the way of Cain. God's own people have gone the way of Cain. What they did is they took their own natural strengths, the work of their hands, and they said, we're going to go build something for God. We're going to go do something for God. We're going to exert our natural strength, our natural effort. We're going to go build something for God. And the Lord says to them, that's the way of Cain. God doesn't need us to build anything for God. God wants us to use that whatever talent, whatever resources, whatever creativity, whatever personality God's given you, God will use that. But it's going to come out of your intimate relationship with the Lord. I mean, for example... You know, there's no way in the world, I, you know, for me, I could never, ever lead worship as much as I want to. Dad, Dad also, we, we both sing like a dog that's dying and we can't clap on beat. So no matter how filled we get with the Holy Spirit, maybe in heaven, but not on this life, neither Dad nor I will ever be able to lead worship. Okay, and so God uses your natural or even supernatural gifts, talents, and resources but he uses them as the spirit leads, not as the soul leads. I want to do something for God. I want to build a tower. I want to build a tower that reaches into heaven. I want to do something that, that you know, God would like, God would love. And God's like, no, I don't work that way. Anything you do from the soul does not please me. It must be from the spirit from beginning to end. This is, and I want to read this quote by Watchman Nee. And we'll show the slide here for this as well so you can see it. Very, very important quote. This is very, very important for us. God's pleasure or displeasure is not founded upon the principle of good and evil. Okay, get this, get this. 
God's pleasure or displeasure is not founded upon the principle of good and evil, or you could say right or wrong. The principle of good and evil, the principle of right and wrong. What's right? What's wrong? What's good? What's evil? Rather, God traces the source of all things. An action may be quite correct, yet God inquires, what is its origin? As human beings, we distinguish between good works and evil works. God, on the other hand, goes behind and makes a distinction as to the source of every work. What is the source of every work? It doesn't matter if you fast for 40 days. It doesn't matter if you read the Bible backwards and forwards. If that's coming from the soul and not the spirit, God looks at the source and says, that source needs to change. Now again, it's better to live from the soul and obey God in the power of the soul than disobey him, so don't mistake what I'm saying. But God wants to go deeper so that the source the life source you live by is not the soul, but the spirit. God doesn't look at what you did good and what you did evil. God says, are you living by the life, are you living by the source of life in you? What life source does this come from? So you can do a good work for God, and it comes straight from the soul. You can do a good work for God, and everyone around you can praise you and applaud you and say, wow. He's so talented. He's so anointed. God's really called him. God's really blessed him. And God looks at him and says, no, you did it in the power of your soul. Because you did not wait on me to be filled with me, to be filled with life. Now, again, this is, some, this is where I would say, if you don't have this book, a little plug here. If you don't have this book, read chapter 4 slowly. Read chapter 4 slowly because there's a lot of nuance here. I go through a lot of the different nuance in here of pitfalls on both sides of this, okay? So read chapter 4 very slowly because God wants us to get to this place where we're, we're spirit-led. Not only are we spirit-led in what we, what we do, but we're spirit-led in how we carry out the act of what God says to do. Because you can actually be spirit-led in what God says to do but carry it out in the soul. Carry it out with natural strength. Carry it out by self-reliance. Carry it out with your own human wisdom and intellect. And God's like, no, 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 no. Not only do you need to be spirit-led from the beginning, but you need to be spirit-led in the execution. And you need to be spirit-led until the end. Spirit-led from beginning to end. Okay, the second life source, or the second, uh, actually the second uh, expression of soul life is self-reliance. This probably gets every one of us. And by the way, I'm preaching to myself today, okay? So I just want you to know, I need this just like you need this. I, I'm preaching to myself today. Self-reliance. I mean, how, how often am I independent? How often are you independent? Just, I can do this. God, I got this. I, you know, you told me to do this. I can do it. I can do it, Lord. Self-assertion. Self-determination. Strong-willed independence. See, even, that, even, even with good intentions, even wanting to do something good for God, that self-reliance suppresses the spirit because it says to the Lord, I'm good. I got it. I can, I can carry it out to completion, Lord. See, the, the soul can oppose the Holy Spirit, not, even, not just in sin, which we know is true. The soul can oppose the Holy Spirit even in that which is good if it doesn't rely upon the Spirit of God for the strength and the grace to carry out what God says to do. It's spirit-reliance, not self-reliance. It's spirit-reliance from beginning to end. Every, this is what it means to be led by the Spirit of God. This is what it means to be joined to Him and live by His life, is that we're not self-reliant, we are spirit-reliant. When you're spirit-reliant and not self-reliant, you wait on the Lord. You don't go off and say, I'm going to go execute a good idea. I'm going to go do something for God. Or, no, this makes logical sense. I'm going to go out and do what seems logical. The Lord's like, no. Now, sometimes what seems logical is a logical thing to do that God leads you to do. And I'm not saying you have, on every 
little thing, you have to be spirit-led, like, okay, I'm going to Home Depot. Now, for me, going to Home Depot, I do need to be spirit-led or at least call Chris and ask him what I need to buy. But if, you know, a lot of you, you know, just, just, just waiting on the Lord and not just saying, okay, I'm just going to go have a good idea. I'm going to use my own wisdom and logic and reason and try to figure out a pragmatic plan of what I need to do. Spirit reliance is waiting on him. Okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, what are you saying for me to do? Like David, I inqu- David inquired of the Lord. It, it just was, it was so simple. Okay, David, they're coming around. You need to go out to battle. And David's like, no, I need to go inquire of the Lord. Lord, are you saying to go? Lord, are you saying to execute? Lord, are you saying to do this? Are you saying to do that? David inquired of the Lord. David was spirit-led. See, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15.10, this, this is where we really have to have some balance here. He said, he said, I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. What was it that empowered Paul to labor and to work more than any other apostle or worker? It was God's grace. It was God's power. God's grace is God's power. God's grace is God's enablement. God's grace is God's assistance. God's grace is the dunamis power that gives you the ability to do whatever he's called you to do. And so Paul was saying, because I was leaning on the grace of God, I outworked every other apostle. See, if you're hearing in this to become inactive, you're hearing the wrong message. I'm not saying to become inactive at all. I'm saying if you're really led by the Spirit of God, you are going to do so much you will not have time for anything else. Not you, but the grace of God empowering you. Okay? Listen, the parable, the ta- I've seen this, this ditch in the Spirit-led life. Is some people say, well, we're just waiting on God to tell me what to do. We're just waiting on God to give me instruction. And they never end up doing anything. 10 years go by, 15 years go by, 20 years go by, and they're still waiting on the Lord. That's not waiting on the Lord. That's you become inactive and passive by deception. I mean, you got to read the parable of the talents. The Lord gives different talents. And he says, go do business with this talent and multiply the gifts and the resources and the influence that I've given you. Don't just sit on it and bury it in the name of waiting on God. See, so many people, I'm telling you, who get into the living by the indwelling life of Christ are burying their talents in the name of waiting on God and in the fear of birthing an Ishmael. The Lord said to them, he even said, he addressed it in that parable. He said, why were you afraid? And the, no, no, the, the, actually, the servant said, I was afraid, so I went and hid my talent. The fear of even becoming soulish and the fear of birthing an Ishmael and the fear of doing a good work instead of a God work can actually cause you to, to bury the talents and come under God's judgment at the judgment seat of Christ. See, I think some of us need to, to hear this because God wants to, whatever, whatever gifts, talents, resources, influence, God wants you to grow those. God wants you to increase those. God wants you to cultivate those, multiply those for the advancement of the kingdom of God. Not to become inactive and passive, but not to do it by soul power. To do it by the enabling power of God's grace. That doesn't mean you're always going to have goosebumps when you do it. That doesn't mean everything you do is going to be easy. I mean, like, for example, writing this book. By the way, I told you this book's out now. You should get it. Just kidding. Just an example, writing this book. God called me to write this. I mean, probably 10% of the time I felt goosebumps or, or chills or emotions, I guess is a better word. I felt, I felt something, you know, 10 to 15% of the time. I really felt God moving. About 85% of the time was just like toiling and, and, you know, chiseling rock and just being faithful just to get there and, and just, you know, we don't feel anything and just persevere and type and write. And it wasn't, it was not angelic visitations. It was not like, you know, Holy Spirit moments the whole time. A lot of it was just like toiling and hard work. 
My point is, and like dad doing life school, and dad multiplying life school. I mean, he's not feeling Holy Spirit goosebumps when he's sending out message or you know budget requests and you know handling different issues and all this. A lot of it's just hard work, but it's the grace of God that empowers you. So Paul said, "I labored more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me." If God's grace, if you're really living by the indwelling life of Christ, you are going to bear much fruit. Not just the gifts, not just the fruit of the Spirit, but you're going, to, you're going to bear fruit of kingdom work, kingdom work that multiplies and advances God's kingdom. Amen. Just staying on this theme of self-reliance, another expression of self-reliance is self-sufficiency, where self is at the center instead of Christ. And you know what Jesus said to the Laodiceans, he said, he said, I wish that you were hot or cold. Because you're a lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. What was their attitude? Their attitude was, I am rich. I have need of nothing. See, the Laodiceans were in a state of self-sufficiency. And that state of self-sufficiency saying, okay, I have everything I need. I'm good, Lord. I'm doing good. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. You love me, I love you, and they grew lukewarm, and the Lord's like, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. See, self-sufficiency means, lukewarmness means, I'm okay where I'm at in my present relationship with the Lord. That's an expression of soul life. I'm okay, I'm good. My present hunger level, okay, I'm content with where I'm at in the Lord. I'm content with the fruit that I'm bearing. I'm content with the ministry influence that I have. I'm content with the intimacy level I have. I'm content with my present, present prayer life. I'm good, Lord. I'm good. And the Lord says, no, you don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. What was happening was the soul, the soul of the Laodiceans was living and not Christ. And they were self-sufficient. What's that common denominator between self-satisfaction and self-sufficiency? It's self-living rather than Christ. Amen. Does anyone feel like they're being cut back yet? Hopefully. I am. Number three, the third hindrance is the rational mind. The rational mind. So let's share the slide here. I want, to make sure, I want to make sure this is, I walk through this slowly because you can really misunderstand what I'm saying to think, okay, the mind isn't important. The mind is important. The mind is important. Okay, so I'm going to read this here. The mind is essential. Okay, just catch this. Sometimes spirit-led, charismatic Christians miss this. The mind is essential to fully experiencing Christ in dwelling life. But the mind makes a terrible leader. That's, that's really what we're getting at right now, is leadership, governance. The mind is a terrible leader. The Lord designed your mind to serve your spirit. The spirit was never meant to be governed by the rational mind. So we're talking here about leadership, government, what you're, who you're following. Are you following what logic dictates? Are you following what your thoughts speculate? This one, this one really gets me. I'm very logical, okay? I'm very analytical. I'm very, very analytical. So a lot of times I'll just be like, okay, well, this, this rational, logical thing is to do this, this, and this. And so I go off and do it, and I never, ever wait on the Lord to say, okay, Lord, is that what you were saying? Now, sometimes that's true. Sometimes the Lord's like, yeah, just use your mind. That's exactly what I'm saying. But sometimes we do it, and the Lord's like, no, you didn't even ask me, okay? You were led by your rational mind. See, we got to understand this, that knowing truth mentally is not the same as experiencing life inwardly. So much of Christianity in the Western world thinks, okay, the goal of Christianity is the cultivation of the mind. Not realizing that knowing truth mentally is not the same as having life experientially. See, knowing truth in your heart is not the same as knowing, 
or knowing truth in your mind is not the same as knowing Christ in your heart. So again, knowledge is important. I mean, try to live without knowledge. Try to live without thinking. You're not going to go very far. But the mind is meant to serve the spirit. If you try to, to have a relationship with God by analyzing, by reasoning, by logic, by deduction, you will never, ever be able to commune with him. God is spirit. God is spirit. And God, God is spirit. God communicates and connects with you spirit to spirit. He doesn't have a direct connection. We're talking about inwardly. Okay, We're talking about your inward relationship. You saw that your spirit and, your, and the Holy Spirit are one. He speaks directly to your spirit. He speaks directly to your spirit. He does not speak directly to your mind. He speaks to your spirit, and your spirit then releases that life upward into th- in the form of thoughts to your mind, and your mind then understands. But see, if we're trying to, through our, through our rational, logical mind, try to understand God, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. See, the soulish man cannot understand the spirit of God. The soulish man is trying to figure out God with their mind, their brain, not realizing we must know him spirit to spirit. Does that make sense? We've got to remember this, that the Pharisees who studied the Torah backwards and forwards, day and night, they they could quote entire passages, entire chapters of the Torah. And yet Jesus said to them, you search the scriptures, but you don't realize that the scriptures are pointing to me. And you have not come to me that you might find life. See, the Pharisees thought, okay, they had a relationship with the book and not with the person. And they actually crucified the one to whom these verses pointed because they were pursuing knowledge rather than life. They were pursuing a book rather than a person. That obviously doesn't mean we should not, we should not read the Bible. We should. We should meditate on the word of God day and night. We should meditate on the word God day and night, but not for the goal. This is where a lot of Christians make the mistake. Not of the goal of acquiring knowledge, even the knowledge of scriptures, which is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. But if our goal is to get the knowledge of scripture rather than the knowledge of Christ whom the scriptures reveal, then we will be still living from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, we want to pursue a relationship with with the Lord through the scriptures, not use the scriptures to just fill our minds with knowledge. Because filling our minds with knowledge can just, Paul said, knowledge puffs up and makes proud. How many Christians today, because they have knowledge of the scriptures, are, are are not even, are not close to the Lord at all? They're still like the Pharisees. They know the book, but not the person. But obviously, we need, if you're, you know, as a teacher of the Word of God, you need the mind to get in there and dig into the Greek and dig into the Hebrew and cross-reference and look at different things and what does this context mean and what does this author mean here and there. You need all that. I mean, you've got to use the mind to do that, but the goal of it isn't to, to fill the mind with knowledge. The goal is to get closer to Christ. See, the issue is, are you governed by the rational mind? Are you govern, governed by the rational mind? Is your mind the leader? That's, that's really what we're getting at. Is your spirit the leader or is your mind the leader? Are you governed by rational thoughts? Are you are governed by reasoning? See, those who are governed by the rational mind, they rely more on reasoning than revelation. They rely more on reasoning than revelation. They depend upon what their mind can speculate more than the internal promptings of the Holy Spirit. So again, please understand, Scripture says, you are to love the Lord with all of your mind. The mind is not meant to like, you know, you're not meant to empty out your brain to be led by the Holy Spirit. Being in the charismatic movement for whatever many years, 25 plus years, 
we've seen our fair share of people who make decisions and you just are going, did you really think that one through? I mean, did you really think that through and think that was a good idea? Well, the Spirit led me. I'm like, yeah, I don't think he led you. <laughs> so the mind has to be the servant of the Spirit but we got to, th- I mean, this doesn't mean we abandon intelligence or we abandon the mind. It means the mind comes into submission to the Spirit and becomes the servant of the Spirit. See, does that make sense? The synergy there that's needed. Okay, let's move on to point number four emotions and experiences. Let me read this one again so I'm going to show the slide here just so we get this one as well. This will, get, this will get some others probably more than the mind did. The Lord designed your emotions to serve your spirit. The spirit was never meant to be governed by your emotions. The issue is whether your emotions are leading you or your spirit is leading you. That's the issue. It's leadership. The emotions are essential to fully experiencing Christ and dwelling life, but the emotions make a terrible leader. See, if you're more emotional than rational, your great temptation is to begin to believe whatever your emotions tell you. If your emotions feel happy, then then you're going to believe you're happy. If your emotions feel sad, you're going to believe you're sad. Whatever your emotions tell you is going to be what you believe rather than the truth of God's word. See, one minute you're happy, one minute you're sad. You're like a roller coaster led by emotions, thinking that you're being led by the Spirit of God. No, you're being led by emotions. We don't walk by feelings, we walk by faith. We don't walk by how we feel, we walk by faith in what God's word says. God's word says you are connected spirit to spirit to the Holy Spirit. And that connection cannot be separated. You are are connected to the Holy Spirit, spirit to spirit. Your emotions say, I feel far from God. Your emotions say, he's a million miles away. Your emotions say, I'm dry and I'm dead. And the Lord says, no, those are your emotions. You're believing your emotions. You're being led and governed by your emotions. You're, being, you're believing what your emotions are telling you rather than the truth of God's word. God's word says that you are connected to him spirit to spirit. God's word says that the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead now dwells inside of you. God's spirit says, or God's word says, your spirit is now righteous and complete and holy and Christ-like. Your feelings say, I'm so unworthy. I'm so unworthy that God doesn't love me. God doesn't like me. I feel forgotten. And the Lord's like, no, I can never forget you. I've inscribed you on the palm of my hand. Your emotions lie to you. If you are led by the emotions, you're led by lies instead of truth. Emotions, Emotions are meant to express the indwelling life of Christ. I love it when I feel the presence of God. I love it. But if you're led by emotions and you don't feel the presence of God, what's going to happen when the, it, everything dries up? Because it will. There are times when you go through wilderness seasons. There's times when it seems like God isn't speaking. There's times when all that happens. And if you're led by emotions and you're led by feelings and you're like, okay, Lord, where are you? Yeah, I'm a million miles away. And it was like, no, I'm closer to you than your skin. I'm connected to your spirit. But if you're led by those emotions instead of by the Spirit, then you're going to feel as if God's mad at you, God's angry at you, God, you did something wrong, you did something to displease God. Don't allow your feelings to lead you. You will become unstable and double-minded. Some of us are double-minded. We're thinking, okay, This or this, this or that. And God's like, no, your feelings are governing you, not the spirit. James said, you double-minded person. You can't get anything from God when you're double-minded. How do you get double-minded is when your emotions are leading you. I feel this, I feel that, I feel this. And, you know, I, you know, I hear people talking these days, maybe I sound like an old grumpy man, get off my lawn kind of guy, but I'm like, everyone these days is like, I just feel, I just feel, I just feel. I'm like... No, you, you think. What you're expressing is you think. I don't know, it's just become popular to say that. Anyway, that's my own little pet peeve. I probably sound old, get off my lawnish. 
Anyway, anyway, we'll move on from that. But don't be led by your feelings. You will be double-minded. Be led by the Spirit of God. Still there? See, if we're going to learn to live by the indwelling life of Christ, we're going to have to silence the voice of our emotions that tell us you are far from God, God doesn't like you, God's mad at you, you're never going to become what God wants you to be, and you feel it, you, you feel this way, you feel that way, you feel condemned, you feel ashamed, you feel unworthy, you feel, feel, feel. Those are just feelings. God's truth says you are accepted in the beloved. God's truth says you have everything you need for life and godliness. God's truth says you are righteous in Jesus Christ. God's truth says you have the overcomer in you and you can overcome as he lives in you and through you. God's, see, when, you're, when your feelings are ruling you, you're going to be up one moment and down the next moment. You're going to feel rejected, sad, mad, angry, glad. Now, I'm not saying we don't feel emotions. We do feel emotions. I'm not trying to make us like some statue or something. Emotions are important, but emotions cannot lead. They are the expressors of Christ in dwelling life, not the leader. See, what happens, this is really tied into emotions, is what happens is now is we move into spiritual experiences where now we have to have a spiritual experience to connect with God. Now, what, let me explain what I mean by this because spiritual experiences are very important. God speaks, not just in the word, not just spirit to spirit. God speaks in dreams, visions, prophetic encounters, angelic visitations, just many ways that, that God speaks. But when we are an emotional-led person, we go from one experience to, spiritual experience to another. Instead of learning to connect with God spirit to spirit, we're running. This is special. I don't, this is not really true here, but in the charismatic church, it's, it's very, very prevalent. We're charismatic, but in, in a lot of the charismatic church, it's very prevalent. We're running here, there, and everywhere for another experience. If you really peel down the layers of the onion, what people are really after is the emotional rush they get from the experience rather than that inward relationship with the Lord. Now, don't get me wrong. I love spiritual experiences. I love it when I experience the Lord um, in, in a different way, dreams, visions, encounters, and things like that. I love those things, but my relationship with the Lord is not based upon the experiences. My relationship with the Lord is not based upon the emotional high that comes out of revelation. I love it when God reveals things to me. I love it. There's no greater feeling than the pleasure that comes when he reveals his word to me. But I'm not seeking the Lord for the revelation. I'm seeking him. Whether I feel it or whether I don't, I'm, I'm pursuing this inward relationship with Christ. Whether I feel the high or I don't feel the high, I'm not addicted to the emotional euphoria that comes from an experience. You see what I'm saying? You know, when, when Christians are governed by emotions, they, you know, they have to feel God's presence. And I, I, listen, I love feeling God's presence. Okay, do you see what I'm saying? The nuance of it, okay? A little bit. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you're just a statue and you don't feel God. You do feel God, but there's times when you don't feel God. You know, when I first turned to the Lord, I felt like for a year, all I did was cry and weep and weep of the love of God coming on me. And I got addicted to that feeling of love. It was incredible. It was better than any experience I'd ever had in the world. The love of God coming on to me and baptizing me in his love. I just wept for, it seemed like every day for a year, just weeping and weeping and weeping. But you know what? I got addicted to that feeling of love. And I was seeking that feeling of love rather than I was seeking the Lord in an inward relationship with him. Now, I will take that feeling of love anytime. It's incredible. But my relationship is not based on that feeling. Not my relationship with him is not based on that experience. See, especially in the, you know what I'm saying, in the charismatic church, don't we, don't we move in this easily? We're so especially some in the, the outer fringes of this, 
one experience to the next experience, instead of having that inward communing relationship with the Lord. You still there? Again, don't move to the other side of the pendulum and say emotions aren't important. Emotions are important. Feelings of God's presence are important. They just should not be the leadership of your life. The Spirit should govern you, not emotions. See, if your emotions govern you, listen to this. If your emotions govern you, if you're, if you're led by your emotions, it's very easy to think maturity equals feeling God's presence. If I feel God's presence, therefore I'm mature. If I feel joy in the Lord's presence, therefore I'm mature. And it's like, no, maturity is measured by the measure of Christ in you. Maturity is measured by the amount of life in you. Maturity is measured by your conformity into the image of Jesus Christ. Your mind, your will, and your emotions, your heart, your desires, your inward life conformed into his image. That's maturity. And your obedience to his voice, that's maturity. See, so many people think, okay, you know, especially when you first get going in the charismatic church, the people that you think are so mature are the ones that have the greatest outward expressions in the worship time. When you really get to know some of them, and this is, I'm thinking like 20 years ago, not now. When you really get to know some of them, you're like, what are you doing? What are you thinking? <laughs> you know, you just realize that is not maturity. That's not maturity. The outward expressions, the outward experience is not maturity. Maturity is the inward conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. See, it's important that we understand, you understand God, your connection to Jesus Christ never wanes, never dissipates. You were always connected to him spirit to spirit, no matter what you feel like. Okay, number five. This will be the last area we look at here. And we'll, we'll read this slide again to uh, just really make sure we get it. Is the Lord designed your body to serve your spirit? The spirit was never meant to be governed by your body. The issue is whether your body is leading or your spirit is leading. The body is essential to fully, to fully experiencing Christ indwelling life, but the body makes a terrible leader. See, if, if your soul, if you're living by self-life in your soul, what will eventually happen is the lust and the rebellion and the death that's in, the, the sin that is in your body, Paul makes it very clear that sin is in your body. And that sin is not going to be removed until you get a new resurrected body in the second coming of Jesus Christ. That sin, if you're living by self-life in your soul, the sin in your body will eventually take over and your soul will obey the body of sin. You'll obey the lust that rage in your body. You'll obey the jealousy or the envy. You'll obey what that carnal nature wants you to do, the anger, the uh, division, um, you know, the impatience, whatever it is. You'll begin to obey that if your soul is leading. The, the, the soul will eventually, the soul is living and self-life is living, the soul eventually obeys the body and the cravings of the body, even if those cravings of the body are, are violate God's word. See, what happens is if the soul is living, if the soul, if self-life in the soul, say it that way, if self-life in the soul is living, eventually, with, without you even trying, you are going to eventually produce the sins of the flesh. Paul says in Galatians 5, the sins of the flesh, immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry. You know, you could read the whole list. But those sins of the flesh are naturally going to be produced when self is living. And so we have to understand the way God... See, I think we've, we've lost what God, how God really views the flesh. I think this, this whole seeker-sensitive movement is coming to the church, and we don't really say what scripture says anymore about how God views the flesh. And when I say the flesh, I mean the soul, the unrenewed soul, the unredeemed body coupled together, working together. Paul, or the scriptures are very clear is that 
The, the flesh can never please God. The flesh is hostile to God. The flesh can never, ever obey God. See, the only solution for the flesh is the cross of Jesus Christ. God cannot reform the flesh. God cannot educate the flesh. God cannot moralize the flesh. The only solution for the flesh is the cross. If we're living in the flesh, we can never please God. Ah, we need to fear the Lord again of the flesh and like, oh, I don't want to live in the flesh. See, not even the all-powerful God who could do anything, not even God can reform the flesh. He must crucify it. And he must not only crucify it, he must release from the inward man, the life of the Spirit of God to keep that flesh crucified. The flesh, whether it produces good works or evil works, is all the same to the Lord. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying all sins are equal. I'm not saying that. But I mean, in the eyes of the Lord, the only thing that can please God is Jesus Christ. It's it. And us living by his life. And Christ being formed in you. The flesh can never please God, ever. If you're living in the flesh, you cannot please God. If you're living in the flesh, you're hostile to God. God, may we hate the flesh like you hate the flesh. Lord, let us have the burden. Let us have that burden that we would not live in the flesh. God's only, the only solution God could come up with, and it's a great solution for the flesh, is to impart his dead raising, life giving, universe creating power into your human spirit so that your spirit would be resurrected and your spirit would live and you would be filled with Christ and you would put to death the deeds of the flesh which are hostile to God and rebellious to God. May, you know, like it says, I think it's in Jude, may we hate the garments even spotted or defiled by the flesh. God, give us that, that we would not want ever, ever to be governed by the flesh. Lust, jealousy, envy, strife, division. You can read all about, about that in Scripture. See, if we choose to live self-life in the soul, the soul's nature to live for self and the body's sin in the body draws out that sin. So it draws it out like a magnet. So you will, with that, it's just a natural law. It's just like the law of gravity. If self life, if you live just like the law of gravity, you throw a ball up, it comes down. If you are living, you are going to live in the flesh 100% of the time. It takes a greater power, a greater law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, that law to overcome the law of sin and death that's working in your body. And just like an airplane who, who flies by the law of, of aerodynamics, overcomes the law of gravity by a greater force, a greater power. It's the power of Christ in you that overcomes the flesh. And if you don't rely on that power, you will be pulled into the flesh 100% of the time. I don't care how nice you are, how good you are, how good your intentions. It's a law that cannot be violated. It cannot be violated. It takes a power to overcome that flesh. It is a law. You, no matter how good you are, no matter how nice you are, you cannot overcome that without the Spirit of God. So as we bring this to a close, I still have 15 more minutes. No, I'm kidding. As we bring this to a close, for real, most of us are not 100% spirit-led. <laughs> I'm not. If you are, you should be preaching. So <laughs> I'm not. You're not. We're not. We're, we're a work. Okay, we are a work in progress. You know, for some people, it might be 30% spirit-leading. 
40% soul, 30% body. For others, it might be 10% spirit, 80% soul, 10% body. I don't know. That's probably an overland analytical, emotional person. Still others would be 5% spirit, 10% soul, 85% body. That's someone really carnal. And I don't know exactly what percentage it is, but I think God wants to move us to shift us into be those spiritual people that are led by the Holy Spirit. Spiritual people that we would strive. This is, the, this is what we're getting at with the soul and the body is synergy. Synergy. Spirit first, spirit leading, spirit governing, spirit strengthening, spirit revealing, spirit communicating, the soul becoming the executor, the expressor, the processor of the spirit's input, the body serving whatever the soul says. But there's synergy between the spirit, the soul, and the body. And God wants to bring us into that synergy to where we learn how these things work together. We're not killing the soul. We're not killing the body. We're using the, the body and the soul or the servants of the spirit as the spirit of God strengthens us and fills us. And so, you know, I would say it like this is um, now that I'm teaching on this, especially in my house or with my dad or whatever, my brothers, if I say one semi-carnal or soulish thing, they're like, ooh, not living by the indwelling life of Christ. So, I mean, I, I can't even, you know, I can't even like watch a game now without them going, ooh, a little soulish, you know, and the angels the same way. It's like, okay, <laughs> we're working this out, okay? I'm not, I'm not one, you know, I'm not even anywhere close to 100% spiritual. And that doesn't mean you can't have fun, watch games, or, you know, enjoy life or any of that stuff. In fact, you will be, if, if, you, if you can learn what I'm talking about, you will be such a better father, such a better mother, such a better spouse, such a better employee or employer. You will, whatever you do, if you can learn to live by the indwelling life of Christ, you will be so much better to be around. <laughs> you'll be so much better. Every, you know, you'll, people, unless you're calling them to repentance, you know, the, in which you might be, um, they will, there'll be something about you, especially, you know, you can be an aroma for death or an aroma for life, but there's something about you people will be drawn to, people will, will be attracted to if you're living by the life of Christ. Now, if they're living in sin and you're living by the life of Christ, they will not want anything to do with you. But those who are truly living by the indwelling life of Christ, you, there will be this attraction. You'll become a better person. You'll become the person God created you to be. You know, sometimes people go, okay, well, how do I become a better father? How do I become a better mother? How do I become a better husband? How do I become a better wife? How do I become a better worker or minister or whatever that is? And I just say it's simple. And it's not simple, but it's the, the answer is simple. Living, it's not simple. The answer is simple. Live by the indwelling life of Christ. Learn to live by the indwelling life of Christ. And you will be the person God has created you to be. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for today. And Lord, our prayer today is that, that you would help us to process and work out, Lord, these details. Lord, I just pray that we would be spiritual people. Lord, led and governed by the Holy Spirit, I pray. Lord, I pray right now that we would be spirit first, Soul second, body third. Hopefully we're not having an earthquake. <laughs> Lord, I, I pray that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, that you, that you would get us free of the mixture. That we would be, Lord, wherever we are in our percentages, Lord, that you would ha help us to be free of mixture. That we would be those that are led by the Spirit of God from beginning to end. We just pray that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I'll say one thing before we end. Just, uh, just one more time. Indwelling life, especially now, I'm, I'm kind, of, kind of, people are laughing at me. You're like becoming this Tony Robbins marketing person. So, um, 
No, for real though, I feel like I barely touched the surface of this session today. The session four, it, it's, it goes into more detail, uh, or chapter four, I should say, in this book, Indwelling Life. Just really want to encourage you to slow down, prayerfully think through chapter four, um, how to apply that to your life, what it means, what it looks like in your life. So anyway, just want to encourage you to get that book and, and read especially chapter four so that these hindrances of self-life and all that that means, might, might, uh, God might do a deep work there. So anyway, God bless you for joining us online. We'll see you next Sunday and hope you have an awesome week. I got the thumbs up. Amen. Thank you for paying attention. Yes, there's only a few people that drifted, so that's good. That's, that's better than last week. No, I'm kidding.